Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the American Maritime Podcast. Today we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks of 9-11. We honor those who lost their lives on that fateful day and we celebrate the heroism and the dedication of those Americans who came to the rescue of our fellow citizens and worked so hard to protect our homeland and our national security. I'm Jennifer Carpenter. I am honored to be hosting today's podcast. I'm a member of the American Maritime Partnership, and I am president and CEO of the American Waterways Operators. If you're new to the American Maritime Podcast, welcome. We talk about the stories and the topics that matter to the 650,000 American men and women who make American Maritime run afloat and ashore. And we are delighted, I am honored, to be joined today by a very special guest, Admiral James Loy, someone I have had the privilege of working with, learning from, looking up to for more than two decades. Admiral Loy was the Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard from 1998 to 2002. He was there on 9-11. He subsequently served as the first administrator of the Transportation Security Administration and the second Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Admiral Loy, welcome. It is really a privilege to have you with us today. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Looking forward to our conversation. So set the stage for us. I think all of us can remember exactly where we were, what we were doing when we got the news that the Twin Towers had been hit. Uh, where were you? What were you doing? What happened next? I was actually in a very important meeting in my office in uh, Coast Guard headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was meeting with uh, several of the CEOs of the big integrating firms uh, around the country talking about the prospective contracts that would be associated with modernizing the offshore Coast Guard fleet in the next 20 years. Uh, so those guys from uh, Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics and others were in my office and were talking our way through how to pose the contract, how to put it together. I had a, 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 an unexpected interruption when my aide came to the door and said, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you need to see what's going on in New York. Uh, turned the TV on in the office and uh, uh, watched the immediate aftermath of the first plane hitting uh, the, uh, the, the World Trade Center Tower. Uh, <clears throat> and then it was only about 20 minutes later, I think the first plane hit in 846, if I recall correctly, and about 20 minutes later the second plane hit the other tower. Uh, the gentlemen in my office were savvy enough to recognize I might have other things to do all of a sudden, uh, and very quietly they got up and left and we resumed that particular meeting and its conversation uh, weeks later. Uh, the immediate concern for me uh, as the Commandant of the Coast Guard was to touch a base with Norm Mineta, who was then the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, and the Coast Guard, of course, was in the Department of Transportation at that point on the calendar. Uh, tried to get a hold of Norm, ended up chatting with Michael Jackson, who was his uh, Deputy Secretary at the time, because Norm had been sort of captured in the White House dealing with the FAA's effort to bring all the rest of the planes in the air down to the ground uh, because we had no idea where the next foot might fall, uh, where the next uh, uh, effort might be with regard to the, uh, to the terrorists. My mind then very quickly went to my responsibilities, which were not about the, uh, the, the domain of the air, but rather the domain of the water. And so we had 22 Coast Guard ships uh, uh, deployed at sea at the time on that day doing their respective counter-narcotics activities or fisheries law enforcement activities, search and rescue activities. We immediately recalled those who were not in a life and death kind of circumstances to establish a harbor entrance control, control uh, effort in all of the major ports of the country. We wondered, like everyone else was wondering, where's the next shoe going to drop? Is it going to be potentially a maritime event as opposed to an air event? Uh, and thus we took steps towards those things that we have always practiced uh, with regard to protecting the ports and the waterways of the, of the nation. Uh, and that was our first steps in the immediate aftermath of uh, knowing what was going on in New York. Tell us how the situation evolved over the next day, over the next week. You know, we look back in hindsight now and we know what happened at the time. There were so many unknowns. How did you process, how did you deal with uh, that situation of just not knowing where the other shoe was going to fall? 
Well, while we were dealing with the, with the notional protection of other ports of the country, the immediacy was, of course, what was going on in New York. Uh, admiral Dick Bennis, uh, who subsequently was an admiral, was then the captain that was responsible for what we called organizationally Sector New York. Uh, God bless him. He had just had a chemotherapy appointment at, uh, in New York City the day before and was literally on I-95 going south into New Jersey uh, where his doctors had told him to go. And to the great credit of a guy like Dick Bennis, and I would like to thank most Coasties on that day, he literally turned around in the middle of the New York Jersey Turnpike and went back to work to deal with what he had to deal with as the sector commander. But I think the tribute really belongs to the maritime community writ large of the Port of New York and New Jersey. Uh, we put out a book, uh, we put out a call from Channel 16, over Channel 16, called All Available Boats. And at that point, whether it was a tugboat, a ferry, uh, almost anything that floated uh, with the responsibilities they already had going on on that day, they responded as American citizens and they responded as members of the American maritime community uh, to deal with the evacuation of lower Manhattan uh, in New York City. An absolutely extraordinary uh, effort on the, on the part of the maritime community of New York led, of course, by the Coast Guard, because that's our responsibility. We were supposed to be the people that led the effort. Uh, but I can tell you without any doubt, we would not have been able to do anything imaginable related to what was necessary were it not for the maritime community of New York stepping forward. The masters on the tugboats, the masters on the ferries, uh, and then all that was necessary to literally offload almost a half a million people from lower Manhattan and take them where they wanted to go, whether it was New Jersey or Staten Island or just away uh, from South, uh, South Manhattan. Uh, the challenges there were, as you can imagine, organizational at first and then executional at, 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 the, second, uh, at the second call. Uh, so uh, we, we decided that uh, the, the port structure on the west coast, uh, Hudson River coast, if you will, of Manhattan, and the battery of Manhattan was going to be the action point from which we would make, uh, make happen what was necessary to make happen. The numbers game is interesting, I think, uh, when we talk about a half a million people yeah. over the course of a day's time. The comparison that everybody uses is about Dunkirk and the evacuation of British and French forces from the coast of France uh, in 1940 uh, as, uh, as Nazi Germany overran France. Uh, the numbers there were about 120,000 members of the British Expeditionary Force and about 100,000 members of the Belgian and French armies that were being evacuated from the Normandy coast uh, on, on that day. But that evacuation took place, I think it was from the 26th of April to the 4th of May. So over the window of about 10 days, they took successfully in terrible conditions, as I would grant, uh, about 300,000 people off the coast. In New York, the maritime community of our nation, as citizens responding to the need of the nation, took a half a million people off of New York in a day. And an astonishing thing when I think back on it, an astonishing thing when anyone reads and understands just how the American maritime community centered in the port of New York and New Jersey rose to the national need on 9-11-01. Yeah, it's really incredible. And hearing your perspective on it just really stirs me. You know, I've worked in and with this industry for more than 30 years, and I just feel such pride and such humility when I think of just the service and the spontaneous response of the American maritime community that day in response to the Coast Guard's call. Did it surprise you, Admiral? And did it change sort of how you view the domestic maritime industry and its role in the Coast Guard's maritime domain awareness mission? I, I don't think I can say surprise. You know, when you're in the middle of that kind of a catastrophic event, uh, you deal with and manage what you have to deal with and manage, and you lead where you can lead, and you encourage others to take on their own responsibilities. The fact that they did so was not a surprise to me from the American maritime community's perspective. Like you, Jennifer, I've been in this business uh, with the American domestic maritime world 
uh, for a long, long time and retired at this point, but nonetheless have enormously good memories. I remember vividly when your predecessor and yourself and I worked on what we called the Responsible Carrier Program, and I watched how because of bad numbers we saw in terms of lives lost and accidents occurring on tugs and ferries in our country, the American maritime community with the leadership of AWO designed this responsible carrier program with the Coast Guard, the safety overseers, quote unquote, if you will, of, uh, of the industry. Uh, and it's one of the great and proud uh, uh, moments of my life to look back on those days and weeks when we designed the responsible carrier program and then when it was made a condition of membership at AWO, watching the American maritime community from coast to coast respond to the uh, standards that were to be imposed on them uh, for safety purposes in their, in their work. So surprise, uh, not so much. Pride, absolutely. Uh, to watch what occurred, how they went out of their way, uh, to respond to this national nightmare and to do so in such an efficient and effective fashion, uh, that was what uh, uh, just r rises in me with pride looking back on that day. Absolutely. How did your experience, Admiral, of 9-11 change you as a leader and how did it change the Coast Guard? Well, for me as a leader, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, my military service in the Coast Guard was as a patrol boat commander in Vietnam. So it was over there that we dealt with whatever was necessary. Or in World War II, it was over there, meaning in the, in, uh, in, the, in the Western Pacific or in Europe. So the notion that this could happen on our home turf was the jarring difference, I think, with regard to what was actually occurring on 9-11. So the following days, weeks, and months of serious thought and activity when I was responsible, as one of the responsible leaders of the Maritime Domain Challenge, was to deal with putting into place uh, national standards that would then serve us better should anything like this ever occur again. Uh, so that had to do with not only the domestic side of life, uh, but recognizing that the maritime, com the global maritime community uh, reacts to standards that are actually set at IMO, the International Maritime Organization. So the next several delegations that I led of American representatives to the IMO was all about learning from what happened on 9-11 in New York Harbor and designing the standards to be set by the global maritime community uh, to better serve themselves as sailors, themselves as uh, uh, as members of that global maritime community in the interest of their own nations and literally in the interest of the international global, time, uh, global maritime community. We all forget often, you know, when we go to Sears or when we go to uh, Kmart or when we go to Walmart that <clears throat> all, well, not all, but probably 75% of the goods we're looking at and considering purchasing for our families probably came to those stores with a maritime dimension in their trip to get to that shelf. Uh, that's something that is n often taken for granted by the American citizenry at large. And it gave us an opportunity to remind everybody that the importance of the American maritime partnership uh, is so, so important to literally the economic and, and even social well-being of our country going forward day after day, week after week. Uh, you are absolutely right. And I mean, that really brings me to the Jones Act, which is, as you well know, is the law that says that vessels that are moving cargo between U.S. points, whether that is on the Inland River system, like so many AWO members, up and down our coasts, on the Great Lakes, out to oil and gas installations, or going forward, offshore wind farms, those are American built, they are American owned, they are American crewed. And you know, you talked about the threat not just just being over there, but the threat being on our shores. I think the Jones Act is just such an important part of sort of the fabric of our nation's maritime homeland security. And I'm interested in your perspective on that as somebody who's been a national security leader for many years. Uh, well, well, it's, <clears throat> it is absolutely uh, true, precisely what you said. It's a sequential kind of notion. You have to understand that in order to provide the citizens of this country with the security that they deserve, 
Uh, <clears throat> and when you recognize that, in many ways, the United States is a bit of an island nation surrounded yeah. by water, literally almost on all of its borders. Uh, and the reality that the ability to be able to depend on those waterways as paths of commerce or as paths of national security interests is an imperative that the Congress and the nation have long uh, understood. And the Jones Act represents the reality that we are wanting to be responsible for that ourselves. Uh, therefore, that US flag vessel uh, that is going to be dealing with that intercoastal trade, uh, with the means by which uh, whatever is necessary for the well-being of our nation, that the maritime dimension of it is dealt with and handled not by somebody we owe allegiance to somewhere, but rather ourselves, as, uh, as a nation ourselves. That is as critical today as it was when the Jones Act was written and legislated into law and will be for the foreseeable future. Uh, amen. So well said. Admiral, what was it like being present at the creation of the Transportation Security Administration, the <clears throat> Department of Homeland Security? I mean, what a massive challenge standing up two new government agencies, you know, in the midst of a really tumultuous and evolving time in, uh, in national and homeland security. Well, tumultuous is the right word. Uh, uh, often uh, the stand-up process was a reaction to something either somebody said or an op-ed in a, in a newspaper or a speech on Capitol Hill or whatever. But the reality of putting together the Transportation Security Administration initially was an expected and normal reaction, I think, of a, of a U.S. government faced with this nightmarish set of attacks on 9-11 on our homeland in the aviation domain. So. While we had the FAA responsible for both security and safety for years and years and years, looking backwards, <clears throat> the decision was made to split that responsibility so that safety remained the FAA's responsibility and this new entity would be responsible for the security dimensions of what was going on. Uh, when President Bush asked me to, uh, to stand up uh, this new uh, agency, uh, we listened very carefully to the advisors around us from the FAA's perspective, uh, uh, very importantly, inside the domain of the Department of Transportation, and then recognized pretty, pretty quickly that in addition to a security element and a security domain in the air, that same thing existed on our land borders and our maritime borders as well. And so the impetus from dealing with the aftermath of 9-11 exclusively in the aviation domain quickly morphed to how are we going to deal with as a nation in the rest of uh, our Homeland Security challenges, thus the birth pangs of the Department of Homeland Security. And as someone who was in government at the time, uh, it's another moment of pride to look back at the conversations that went on within the Situation Room in the White House shaping legislation that would be offered to the Hill and that the Hill would then uh, uh, deal with uh, in the committee structure, uh, responsibly taking hearing inputs from uh, key members of the executive branch of government, and then legislate into law the Homeland Security Act, uh, first of all, the, the uh, Aviation Transportation Security Act uh, <clears throat> of 2002, and then the Homeland Security Act of 2002. Uh, very interesting in that as part of those conversations, it was always about leadership as well. Yeah. And uh, I know President Bush uh, had in mind this guy from Pennsylvania, Tom Ridge. I'm also from Pennsylvania. So uh, his name was being uh, used uh, around those executive branch conversations in the White House and elsewhere. Uh, and I remember uh, calling Governor Ridge, who was then in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and saying to him, um, your name is being bounced around in Washington, D.C., uh, and I'd be honored to come up and help you understand just how we're doing that. He said, uh, I'd be delighted if you would be willing to do that. So I literally went up to Harrisburg expecting about a half an hour conversation with the govern governor, which turned into two and a half hours of conversation because he was quite serious, having already been called by the president to consider the opportunity of leaving his post as the governor of Pennsylvania and coming down to be the Homeland Security Advisor, a position inside the White House, uh, <clears throat> which he, of course, subsequently did. So uh, I think what's really important there is to recognize that 
the president was turning to someone with a reputation for leadership in serious complex challenges, Governor Ridge of the, of the great state of Pennsylvania. This is a gentleman who left Harvard Law School to go be a sergeant in Vietnam in the infantry, uh, returned and then of course has uh, had a storied career of leadership in our country and has also turned out to be one of the dearest uh, friends that I have made over the course of my, uh, my public service career. Uh, so together then the challenge be became recognizing that the law now called for 22 very disparate and very different agencies from all corners of government <clears throat> to find its way to this new echelon called the Department of Homeland Security. So the initial organizing challenge, uh, the initial uh, effort on the part of uh, those agencies to disassociate themselves from their former uh, cabinet level uh, bosses and 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 reteam, so to speak, to become uh, what was in, what was very necessary with regard to the Department of Homeland Security. On the on the on the initial TSA organizational effort, one of the most interesting uh, notions that I had was to look around the world, literally, for who else does this kind of work. And it occurred to me that the Israeli security agency did it very, very well. In the, in the, you know, you can just imagine in Israel when you are having folks look over your respective borders from all kinds of angles, uh, not with uh, uh, good cheer in their minds, so to speak. We suggested that the Israeli security agency and uh, uh, LL, the national agency or the national airline of uh, Israel was probably a good place to go and learn some lessons. So I did that. I had two enormously successful and valuable tours, uh, uh, not tours, but uh, visits uh, to, to Israel. And I will be forever thankful uh, to a gentleman named Doran Bergerbest, who was there in the, then the number two in the ISA, uh, to help me walk through intellectually the kinds of conversations and discussions they had had to shape what they shaped as, uh, as the uh, agencies responsible for these functions in their homeland. Enormously valuable time to help me uh, lead conversations and help shape the, uh, the idea of what a Transportation Security Administration should be all about. Uh, so that follow on to the, uh, to, I mean, the nightmare provided the challenge, this associated effort of collective and uh, collaborative work on the part of the Hill and on the part of the executive branch and reaches to state and local leaders and industry leaders helped us with the design of what was forwarded to the Congress and then enacted as the TSA legislation and then the Department of Homeland Security legislation. So I would like to think that we were not with our heads down the rat hole, so to speak, either afraid of or wondering what we might ought to be doing or what we might ought to be talking to people about. Rather, we sh stood up and said, we need all the help we can get to shape the legislation that's going to be uh, so critical to the future of our country. Oh, that is just fascinating. And I remember well being at your Coast Guard retirement ceremony and hearing the news that you were not going to Disney World. You were going to be <laughs> taking on the TSA helm. And I thought, oh, thank God. That was my reaction as a citizen. So if I had asked you then, Admiral, what do you think is the biggest national security threat facing the United States? And, and I'm asking you that question now. What would your answer have been? And how does today's compare? How do you see the sort of threat landscape uh, evolving in the ensuing two decades? I think it's probably uh, 20 years more complex today than even, uh, even uh, it was then. Uh, but recognizing uh, maybe the thoughtful way to think about that question is to think about who populates the table when the National Security Council meets. Uh, the representatives from the intelligence community, from the Department of Defense, from any of the uh, domestic side of the equation, if you will, on the, on the D.C. side of, uh, of the Potomac River, and the agencies that would be uh, uh, impacted uh, and, uh, and have to rise to the challenge should a 9-11-like event happen in their domains of activity. So that theoretical notion uh, became part and parcel of what was, was drafted and published as the national security uh, 
uh, framework. Uh, <clears throat> National Security Plan was its first title. Its second title was National Security, Security Plan Two, and then it was evolving to be what's now on the shelf as the National Security Framework, where the functional realities of, of assessment on the front end, uh, what would happen uh, for a, uh, a God forbid event on the second end, how do we protect the infrastructure and the people side of our nation, not just the governmental structures, uh, and then the notion of a God forbid event and how do we deal with it in the aftermath. So thinking our way through that series of functionalities enabled us to produce a national security framework that everyone now uh, thinks about practices, exercises, so that should such an event occur again, we're dramatically more ready to deal from all those aspects, those federal responsible aspects of such an event and deal with it constructively rather than sort of making it up as we go in the middle of the crisis itself. Uh, so I feel that from the organizational imperative, our nation is dramatically better prepared for anything like that. But today's world has other dimensions to it. The cybersecurity dimension perhaps being the most evident and the, the whole idea of how we are grappling with the cybersecurity challenge uh, is, uh, is I, mean, I can just imagine that, that in today's National Security Council meetings in the White House, uh, those organizations responsible for that in Homeland Security and in the Pentagon and in the intelligence community are grappling today so as to be prepared to deal with that cyber event in the same fashion we tried to deal with that domestic aviation challenge of 9-11-01. And I think it is that evolving character of recognizing the threat horizon for what it's worth and reshaping and evolving as we go through time so as to A, be best prepared and B, be ready to execute what is necessary on the day uh, anything like that should occur to our country. That just resonates so much with me. I'm, I'm thinking of all of our work together over the years on the safety side, safety management systems, and then thinking about how the Coast Guard and the maritime industry sort of took those lessons and applied them to the challenge of COVID over the last 18 Absolutely. months. So what you're saying about this national security framework being adaptable to the new challenges of a, th a cyber threat world just it really hits home. It makes very good sense. And, and the other reality there is the national impulse on the part of U.S. representatives to international organizations like IMO, where the lessons that we might have tried to prove uh, to ourselves were the right lessons to be learned and share them on an international stage so, it is, so that it's the global community that is able to cope with it on, on their national level and more and more today on the international scope of dealing with each other uh, on, the globe, on the world stage. The, the, the world gets smaller and smaller and smaller every day as days go by. And the ability to collaborate and deal with each other constructively in that phase of any kind of an operation like that is, is every day more important than it was the day before. Now, on the threat side, when you're dealing with uh, for example, in the Western Pacific these days, the maritime challenge of dealing with an emerging China yep. is a very real challenge for us to deal with. I would like to think that we could take advantage of those international organizations uh, to bring to the table great minds from both the West and the East, if this is now the China of the, of the 21st century, and work those elements out in the greater interest of both uh, countries, but on the same stage, be ready, R recognize that what occurred uh, on 9-11-01 was a terrorist event, not necessarily flying the flag of, an, of any given nation, but that in today's world of commerce and trade, uh, those are all pathways where the maritime dimension remains the most important dimension for our country. As I said before, 75% of what comes and goes to this country does not go by air and does not go by any other way other than ships. And so to be constantly of, uh, of concern with regard to the well-being of those commercial pathways, those trade paths of the world, uh, that's part and parcel of what the Maritime Partnership and the Coast Guard think about and deal with day after day after day. 
and, uh, and a very important set of conversations to continue. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you were a believer and really a leader and an ambassador for Coast Guard industry partnership in the in the service of shared goals uh, long before many, many people were talking about safety, talking about environmental stewardship. And it seems to me that we were really able to build on that framework and apply it to the challenge of security after 9-11. Yeah, thank you very much. I, uh, I appreciate that thought. Uh, but I would be the first to say that it was marine safety experts inside my Coast Guard, and it was marine safety experts inside uh, uh, AWO, and your predecessor of uh, being among them. Uh, Tom and I had many, many conversations as we built the Responsible Carrier Program that became the glue that held together the safety realities of the maritime domain here in our country. Uh, we had those terrible figures that, you, Jennifer, you remember so well at the time of those, uh, th the number of deaths, the number of accidents that were recurring on tugboats and barges and ferries around our country. And to get together and think our way through what became the Responsible Carrier Program, and it became the means by which, hey, if you want to be a member of AWO, you've got to sign up for these safety features. Uh, th that, I think, is one of the things I look back on most fondly with regard to my, uh, my public service is to whatever degree I was able to be part and parcel with Tom of getting people to the table that could understand those issues as well as you all did and as we all did and forge the future of our industry in a better light. That's something I look back on with an awful lot of pride. Oh, that's that's fantastic, as as do we. So we talked a lot over the last year and a half during the pandemic about the men and women of American maritime and the transportation system really being part of the essential critical infrastructure workforce. What message would you have? What would you want to say today uh, to the men and women of American maritime from your perspective as somebody who has worked alongside the industry in uh, in a in a national security capacity for so many years? Well, I think it would be, uh, you know, how, however big I can write the word, words thank you, uh, that would be my message to, uh, to, the, to the people of the American maritime trades. Uh, it's just astonishing. My memory goes back to that terrible day on 9-11-01 to watch uh, the members of the New York, New Jersey maritime community rise to the occasion, first as citizens of our country, and secondly as citizens of our country with a special capability to deal with the, the maritime environment, and watch what they did efficiently and effectively when they responded to that call of all available boats on Channel 16 in New York Harbor that day. Uh, it, 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 almost, uh, it, it almost goes beyond your imagination to think about how they traded in whatever they were doing that day and for the foreseeable week, 10 days, two weeks, uh, you know, going back to those numbers that I cited earlier with regard to taking a half a million people off of Manhattan in one day. Actually, it wasn't even a day. It was a 12-hour window uh, that then persisted over the course of the next couple of weeks. Uh, but just an astonishing statement of loyalty, citizenship, and values uh, that, the, that the members of the maritime community of New York and New Jersey, representing those from across, the, from across the country, stood up and were counted. When the nation needed them the most, they stood up and were counted and pulled off this extraordinary feat of evacuating Lower Manhattan uh, on 9-11-01. So for me, it is pride in, uh, in being part of that community in a way, uh, in a way that I will always want to be and hope to be included in that community. Uh, and, and then the thank you uh, of an endless kind of thank you that goes to their work day after day after day, facilitating the commerce and trade of this country uh, in a manner uh, that they should be able to take enormous pride in, and I'm sure they do. 
Admiral, I I can't think of a better note on which to end this podcast. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. I want to thank you for your lifetime of service to our country. Uh, It has really been a privilege to work with you, to work alongside you, and to benefit from your great leadership. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the American Maritime Podcast. Uh, If you liked what you heard, we hope that you will share it with others and that you will tune back in. We are committed to keeping the conversation going about the issues that matter to the people who keep American maritime moving. I'm Jennifer Carpenter. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be here and host today's podcast. Uh, We remember with deep gratitude those who lost their lives on 9-11, and we remember with great gratitude those who worked so hard to keep us all safe. Stay safe, everybody. Mm